few weeks ago at work, Debbie texted me and she asked if I could text Kristen and ask if she was still interested in speaking. And Kristen was like, yes. The other day I was talking with my Bible study and um, if the Lord wanted me to speak, he had to make it very evident to me. Yeah, so Kristen um, is going to share her story with us and it takes a lot of courage to get up here and uh, share someone's story with you. So let's be really attentive. It is a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, hopefully, I think there'll be a lot of you that can glean something from my story. Um, I'm not ashamed of my story at all. Um, in fact, um, as Emily alluded to, there was a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I was talking to my husband and I was just like, I think God's doing something. And he was like, what? I was like, I don't know, but I think he's doing something. And then a week later, as Emily had mentioned, I was with my Bible study and I was saying, um, I think God wants me to speak, but, and I have a lot that I could talk about. I said, but I'm not in a season to be pursuing anything. So he's gonna have to lay it on my lap. And the next day, I, when I got the text from Emily, I was, and she's like, I know you're busy, but, and I was like, oh my gosh, yes, totally, super excited. So then when I sat down and um, started organizing my thought, I whipped out a notebook. And in that notebook, I had a prayer that I don't remember writing, and it was just, it was written in August, the end of August. And um, I write my prayers like letters. And the last paragraph is, Lord, if you have someone who needs your love and encouragement, please send them to me. I want to be your hands and feet. Let people see and hear you through me. I love you. So I think our meeting here is ordained. We are meant to be here together. And I'm so grateful all of you guys are here. So um, as a way of introduction, I'll let you know about my family background. Um, I am one of four children. My parents were faithful Catholics, and um, we went to Mass on Sundays, even while we were on vacation. And um, we did Catholicism the best way we knew how. I had a brother that was three and a half years older than me. I had a brother that was a year and a half older than me. I was, um, and then I had a sister that was seven years younger than me. So I was kind of the youngest of the first three, but the first girl, but my sister was so younger than me. Like my birth order story is like, I felt awkward. And so um, as like my very younger years, I remember thinking like, I did not want to be a girl. I wanted to be like my brothers. Um, I just, and I didn't know really what it meant to be a girl. I just knew that like, I wanted to be like my brothers. And so um, like the biggest insult you could say to anyone in my family was, you're a girl. Um, so it was, it was just awkward. I mean, I, um, I remember one time, we were, my parents were late to my uncle's wedding because I didn't want to wear a dress. Um, I, apparently, I threw an epic tantrum. Um, but that's neither here nor there. What I think is probably the most significant thing is my, there's something deeper that was going on there with my identity. It was that my first memory, like, so how old are you when you get your first memory? You are three or four? I remember we were living in Texas at the time and I was running around the kitchen in the family room. There was like a circle. I was running around the kitchen in the family room. I ran into the bathroom, propped myself up on the mirror, looked at the mirror and thought, she's ugly. Now I can assure you that, I should get rid of this piece of paper, <laughs> that looking at pictures of me when I was younger, I was cute. In fact, my parents, um, I didn't know it at the time, but my parents, um, my mom took me to the library once when I was like four or five in Texas still. And the librarian saw me and she thought, oh my goodness, she is so beautiful. And she said to my mom, um, she should model. And I didn't really, it didn't register to me. So we got in the car and my mom said, um, what do you think about that? She, she said that you should model. And I thought, I'd like to finish school first. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, growing up, like as in every family, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and they act all kind of affect us differently. So my oldest brother, he was, super duper smart, National Merit Scholar. Um, but growing up, he was a little bit socially awkward, and so my parents really spent a lot of time trying to get, you know, get him to find his niche. And then my next brother, um, he was smart, but he was like that kid that didn't turn his homework and got notes from home. And he was also, um, later on, he was a really good athlete, so he was like the high school varsity quarterback. 
And then my sister, because she was so much younger than the rest of us, my parents kind of poured a lot of attention into her because she was kind of like an only child in a lot of ways. So I just kind of felt there. I was completely competent. I was able to do everything that I needed to do. Um, and my parents didn't need to worry about me, which is a good thing. But in retrospect, I can see kind of how it affected me. Um, I think a lot of people would be surprised if they told you that I just kind of felt like I was there, like I was just, I have described it as being like a supporting actor in somebody else's main movie, or somebody else's movie. Like I was just kind of there doing all the things in the background, not attracting any attention. Um, people would think that I was probably happy, outgoing, I had lots of friends, I had strong faith, I played sports, but there was just something missing. Um, some experiences when I was growing up, like when I was youngest, or when I was in um, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, my best friend, she was in beauty pageants. And I thought since I wasn't in beauty pageants, I was ugly. And that my parents must have thought I was ugly too. Um, in middle school, as if middle school isn't awkward enough, I had, so I, I went through like a funny stage, as a lot of people do. They're not my most attractive years. And, um, I had a seventh grade teacher tell me that it was so, I think the word she used was unique, that my face was so full and I had such skinny legs. Like, can you think of any sort of context that would be appropriate to tell a student? Um, and I remember like not knowing how to react. Like I just kind of like laughed and it was just me and her and another friend and I just kind of like laughed. And then I remember like looking down at my legs. I did have chicken legs. I do still have chicken legs. Um, but just feeling like, oh, okay. And then later that same year, I was leaving a class and going to the locker. And these two boys who um, I knew were um, talking and laughing. And one of them says, tell them what you were, do what you were doing. And he basically told, made a face and he was mimicking what he told me that I looked like. That stung. That's the type of thing that really sticks with you, particularly when your first memory is that you're ugly. So those are things, I know that happens to a lot of different people, but I think I was kind of wired to just be like a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so in high school, I. Um, I wasn't as awkward anymore. Um, hormones started kicking in. I looked more like a normal human being, I guess, or as my seventh grade teacher might attest to. Um, but I, and I was hanging out with um, a whole bunch of girls that were on the cheerleading squad. And I'm not like a tall person, but I was like six in inches taller than all of these girls. And they were like super duper teeny. It didn't bother me, I was fine. But then one of the girls at one point trying to be funny, said, we're all the little ones and you're the ogre. I wasn't an ogre, I wasn't fat, nothing. But like, again, it just seems like it just, my life experiences just kept kind of reiterating the message that I had pretty much had ingrained in my brain since I could remember, literally. Um, so while that was going on, I, was, I also was like, I was going to mass every time that I could. Um, like, so that means Sundays and other days just kind of challenging when you're in high school. Um, I prayed the rosary. Um, I was started dating a faithful guy. He was a good guy. Um, but despite that, I had a hole in my heart. And the good things that people would say to me, they just like never took root. And so I'm telling you the, the negative things that were said to me, but I don't remember very many of the positive things. I kind of uh, picture it like a sieve or like a colander, like a strainer. And all the good things would just sift right through and they wouldn't, wouldn't stick around, but the bad stuff just kind of sat there. And they just kind of became who I was. Um, I was just so very much aware, and part of this might have to be with the community that I grew up in, but I was so very aware that I was not the smartest and I was not the prettiest, I was not the most athletic. And I just kind of felt like a stranger, like I didn't have an identity. So that's when the starving and the binging and purging started. Um, I didn't understand how or why these feelings kind of led me to act out the way they did. And I, at the time, I probably would tell you that like, that's 
well, I, I wouldn't have talked about it, to be perfectly honest with you. But um, I, don't, I don't think I knew that that's why everything was manifesting. It's easy to see in hindsight. Um, but I didn't know what I was looking for. So in high school, one of my friend's um, moms called my parents. I'm sure my parents were aware that I had like, lost a lot of weight. Um, but when a friend's parent, who's also a teacher at the high school, calls you and tells you that they're concerned, then that's when they decided to take action. Um, so again, feelings of like, now, not only am I doing this, but people know about it, and people are talking about it, and my parents are, are embarrassed and bothered by it. I felt shame about that. I felt guilt that I was causing them guilt. They got me enrolled in counseling, and I don't know where they found this person, but I drove like 30 minutes by myself to see this woman, and I remember, I don't remember much about the appointment, the first appointment other than like, I cannot believe that I'm here. Like my parents sent me to this person. The homework was grab a piece of cake, grab a mirror and look at yourself while you're eating the cake. Would that fix the God shaped hole in my heart? No. I mean, people just seem to be very concerned about the behavior. They weren't concerned about what it was that I was experiencing on the inside. Um, I kept going anyway. I saw I was played softball in high school, and I told my coach, and I told my coach because I knew I would be missing some um, practices for appointments. And she was very supportive. And I talked to, I told my dad that I talked to my coach, and he got upset. And being a parent now, I can say I can see that it was because it was out of concern. He didn't want me blabbing to people that I had an eating disorder. He was trying to protect me. But it, to me, broken Kristen, that was 17, um, it looked like anger, more shame, more guilt. And I was back to my old habits of going to counseling because I wanted to check that off my list, but I was not healthy. Um, I had a realization that there was something bigger. It was not about food. It was about something else. I didn't know what. I felt broken and afraid. So I went to college, Hillsdale, go Chargers. Um, it, was a, it was a great experience for me. I, um, despite the fact that I was in a really bad relationship, this guy was so not good for me. Um, but I just wanted to be wanted. And um, he really liked that I was skinny. And he made me, made me aware of that. So. I became afraid of gaining weight. So I used to be afraid people were gonna find out, but instead I was afraid I was gonna gain weight. I would buy pants like too small so that I could, that would be like my goal weight. I mean, I was wearing a size zero, so I, it was ridiculous. Um, although I did have health, much healthier friendships. I had faithful friends who cared about me and my well-being that also told me I was in a bad relationship. Um, I went to Bible studies. I was involved in Young Life. Um, I was uh, involved in another community organization in the elementary schools. I was, I don't want to brag or anything, but I was the president of my sorority. <laughs> um, go Kaya. Um, anyway, um, there was still a really big hole and I was still acting out. And so I started going to a psychiatrist once a week my parents wanted to fix me. And again, like, I, this guy was a joke. So this guy, um, he, wanted, he was telling me that I had daddy issues. And he, he said that I had depression, which may or may not have been true. Um, so he put me on this med. And the med, like the number one side effect was weight gain. So I am no, like, doctor or anything like that. But I do know that if the number one side effect of something that someone you're going to treat for an eating disorder is weight gain, you're missing something. So I stopped using the, the meds and I was just out of control. I graduated from college and I got a job as a teacher. Um, I taught seventh grade and I took that job because it was in a K-3 school. I really believed in the philosophy of the school and um, 
I would never have taken that seventh grade job because I hated myself in seventh grade. That was where the teacher told me, made the comments and the friends, or those boys made that comment, and I was not comfortable in my own skin, and frankly, I was not comfortable or mature enough to be able to like, be with a whole bunch of seventh graders and not take on everything that I felt at that age. Um, so I just, it, those feelings of inadequacy, unwor un not worthy, not enough, just kept pounding and pounding and pounding on, on each other. Everybody thought I was doing a great job, but inside I was crumbling. I was acting out a ton. I was having panic attacks in the middle of the night. I was waking up with my heart racing, like in full on crying. I didn't understand what was wrong with me, and I didn't feel like anybody cared enough to take the time to figure it out. Like I knew my parents cared, but I also didn't want to burden them with that. It just seemed like a lot. So I was taking this all on my own. Um, I was going to a new counselor, and she had me take a physical with a different, like just a regular GP. And um, about you know, the next day, I got a phone call from the lab. You need to go to the ER. You do not pass go, do not collect $200, go there right now. I go to the ER, and I was scared, because I was afraid of what they would say. Well, they didn't really say much. They gave me a bag of fluids, they said I was dehydrated, and um, I was there until late in the night when they um, discharged me. And the doctor said to me, he was like a 25-year-old doctor, I don't know, he's young. And I had mentioned, I even mentioned to them that I had an eating disorder. This is why I was sick, and this is why I, my uh, levels are so low, my electrolyte levels are so low. And he told me that I needed to go to Taco Bell more often, and then laughed. Shame, guilt, I felt unknown. I felt like nobody understood me. And I just kind of put that in my pocket and just let it become more of my identity. It seemed, again, it seemed like everybody was so much more concerned with my behavior, like just eat. Well, it wasn't just about eating. It was about what was going on in my heart, but I didn't even know that that was what the problem was. It, it never, it, it had never been presented to me that way. I felt like there was something wrong with my brain. Um, so that next year, I switched grades. I was teaching third grade. I broke up with the toxic, ex the toxic boyfriend. I was doing a lot better. Um, I started dating a lot. I, um, I met up with a guy that I went to middle school with. At one point, we just ran into each other, <clears throat> who we were like friends-ish with and um, middle school and high school, and we started dating and we found out his name was John Woodsome, so spoiler alert, I married him. Um, <laughs> um, so after we were together for a month, literally, we were like, we're getting married, like this is, just, this is just it. And I knew I needed to tell him about my eating disorder. And granted, I've been doing a lot better, um, but I wasn't exactly forthcoming with him about, I made it sound a lot more like it's something that I did suffer from and not something that I still was kind of struggling with on a daily basis. Um, so we got engaged and despite be bearing, being exactly where I always wanted to be, I wanted to be 25, engaged to the love of my life, um, but I still got concerned with enoughness. I mean, I had everything that I wanted, really, but I still didn't feel like enough. I felt like I should feel better. Um, I got, became really afraid of screwing up the relationship and that John wouldn't want me anymore. Um, and I desperately wanted to be wanted. So I was still feeling unknown, unworthy, and not enough, even though I had everything going for me on paper. Um, I started acting out a lot more. Um, I told myself I'd stop after we got married because I knew that he wouldn't leave me after that. Um, six weeks before our wedding, I started getting like really achy feet and swelling. And I had attributed it to um, teaching. I was on my feet a lot, but I'd also been teaching for four years and never experienced anything like this before. And it was like, I would ice them, I would elevate them. John would massage them and it just like ached from the inside of my body. So John's like, Kristen, you really need to go get this checked out. So I hated going to the doctor, but I went, 
and they did a whole bunch of labs. I was thinking like I might have like cancer or something like that. Um, the next day I was on my way to work, I got a phone call from the lab, go to the ER, you're very, very sick. Um, so I thought, okay, I've done this before. But I had this lab done at the University of Michigan and they wanted me to go to a uni the University of Michigan ER last time I went to St. Mary's. So I get there, I am Kristen Connolly, and you're expecting me, and I thought I'd have a bag, go home. Well, that's not what happened. They admitted me into the um, cardiac intensive care unit. I was having congestive heart failure, failure as a 25 year old woman. And I had done it completely to myself. My body was shutting down. I was my body was preparing to die. So when, you may or may not know this, but when you're as sick as I was, and you've done it to yourself, you get special treatment. So my, my, basically my mom and John were in the hospital with me at all times. <clears throat> but I also had to have a babysitter, some stranger, came in on a rotating basis. Um, I think they were volunteers or something. But they thought that I was suicidal. I was not suicidal. They thought because I was so sick that I must have lost the will to live. So I had a babysitters. I, had, I was not allowed to have razors to even just like shave my legs or anything like that. I had to go to the bathroom and take showers with the doors open. I had to have like a little hat on the toilet so that they could monitor that I wasn't doing anything in order to um, keep myself sick, essentially. Three days later, my levels had not moved at all. I had doctors coming in. They were angry at me, but also not talking to me as though I was a normal human being. And probably I wasn't a normal human being because it's not normal behavior. Um, but I felt, I felt like normal. Um, but I also felt very broken. And um, they were calling me a liar, too. And I, I, just felt, I felt complete and utter despair. At one point, somebody before that, a friend of mine had said, you know, if we had a, if, if, you know the story goes that like, if you have, if everybody writes down their struggles on a piece of paper, and you throw them in the, in the pot, and then you can grab whatever struggle you want, you'll end up with your same struggle. No, that was not my case. No, I wouldn't wish what happened to me on anybody. I was laying there in the hospital bed thinking, I wish I had cancer. I wish I, had, I was a drug addict because these doctors think that I just want to be skinny. It wasn't about that at all. It wasn't about the food. It wasn't about what I looked like because I looked horrible because I was too skinny. It was something else and I just didn't know what that was. And keep in mind, this is six weeks before I'm going to get married. I had everything in the world going for me. I had, well, I'll get to that later, all the stuff that was going. <clears throat> I just about given up hope. I still wasn't suicidal, but I didn't know how to live without an eating disorder. I felt so broken, so unworthy, so unlovable. I felt guilty for scaring John and my parents. And I had done all of this on my own, unworthy. That's the only word I could use to describe how I felt. Un, um, without reason, miraculously, I would say, magically is what the doctors probably would prefer to say, on the fourth day, my body started absorbing the electrolytes. And so they were trying to figure out like what to do with me. So they, there was an eating disorder clinic on the ninth floor, at, at least back in 2004, um, that was like an inpatient program. And I wasn't skinny enough for that program. I mean, can you see like, how like, I'm not skinny enough to be sick enough, but I almost died, so I, blah, 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 blah. It's just like, ugh, you guys are all crazy. If you think I'm sick, try, try to help me. So they, it was evident that I was in loving hands because my parents were in and out, and John was in and out. Like, I always had somebody, a family member with me. And, um, so they discharged me with going to an outpatient program at a different hospital. I was at Beaumont. So it was basically like an eight to five thing where it's like, basically if you see like an outpatient psychiatric type thing on TV, it like looks like that. They do arts and crafts and 
music, and they also do um, group therapy. And I, it was not just for people with eating disorders. There were people, there's one mom who had like several um, nervous breakdowns because she was planning her daughter's uh, bat mitzvah. There was a homeless guy who was suicidal. Uh, there was uh, a lot of angry people. And one time in group therapy, um, one of the ladies looked at me and she goes, why are you here? And the guy next to me said, yeah, she's not even skinny. She says she has an eating disorder. <laughs> and she said, your parents are married. They're seriously concerned about you. You're getting married in a couple of weeks. You have a job. You're college educated. Why are you here? I couldn't answer that. But I felt really ashamed, and I felt really guilty because apparently my presence there made her angry. So, again, those feelings of unworthy, not enough, unknown. So the program, I could graduate, graduate whenever it was that I fulfilled, whatever the requirements were, I was on my best behavior and doing, crossing all the T's, trying to be vulnerable enough without getting too deep. Um, I became really good at like hiding things. So I graduated, and like I said, spoiler alert, we got married. Um, it was not perfect. I realized that the baggage that I brought in with the hole in my heart somehow manifest in our, my relationship with John. Um, I went to counseling, I had a better counselor. Um, she saw that I hurt inside, and that meant a lot to me, because I felt like people were just so concerned, again, just about the behavior that they weren't concerned about who I was. Um, I got pregnant unexpectedly. I hadn't had a period in, gosh, probably like six or seven years. So I didn't think I would be able to have kids, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but I did. We had Frank. Did he? You know him. Um, so getting pregnant helped me respect my body. I always, like I said, I always felt my first memory is feeling like like I wasn't enough, but I just felt it was such a gift that my body was working, one, and that I was able to grow a human. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And even giving birth, I gave a birth unmedicated with your first. It's a crazy experience. And I left the hospital waving to the nurse and saying, thank you, we'll be back soon. <laughs> John, is, John was wheeling me back and he was just like, Oh my gosh, like he wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> so for the first time in my life, like I wasn't ashamed of my body. So I was behaving better, but I was still broken. Um, I didn't feel known. I still had these wounds. I didn't understand where they were coming from. It continued to affect my relationship with John. I still didn't understand why. And he was frustrated because I struggled to find joy. I mean, so now, I'm a mother, I'd always wanted to be a wife, I'd always wanted to be a mother, and on paper, like, check, 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 check. But I felt, inside, I felt like broken, 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 broken. Um, I sought help through the sacraments, spiritual directors, priests, and then finally one priest said, you know, God may heal you, but it may just be your cross. And that hurt me so much inside because I wanted so much to be rescued. But at the same time, it helped me because I no longer so desperately sought a solution, and I consciously tried to unite it with the cross. Um, also, John and I, we'd always really worked at our faith together, and we, at the same time, just really decided to seek the Holy Spirit a lot more and be really, like, just seeking that. We didn't even really know what that meant, but we had some friends that were trying to do the same thing, and um, I started writing letters to the Holy Spirit and just invoking the spirit a lot more. And John did here at OLGC a couple years ago. There was a six week program that was dedicated to the Holy Spirit and he was doing it with a buddy of his. In the end, it was like an impartation of the spirit. <clears throat> and he wanted me to go. And I was like, eh, no, I'm okay. Like I was no longer really seeking healing. Um, I didn't feel, God had been showing me some gifts, so I felt like affirmed in that. 
And so I didn't really feel like I needed to go like on a Tuesday night with all the kids and you know the stresses that are involved with that. But he got a babysitter and he really wanted me to go, so I went. And so we were in this room and there was praise and worship and then like prayer ministries going on around. <clears throat> and so I wanted to be there for John and he got up to get in line to get prayed over. And I didn't want to be him to like feel my eyes on him, so I wasn't doing anything. I was kind of looking around what was going on in the room. And people were being slain in the spirit. And I have witnessed that before. Um, I had not experienced it personally before. And I thought, oh, how very nice for them. Like, that's, that's nice. I also kind of doubted like the authenticity of it, I must say, just a little bit. I saw uh, over here, Mary Guilfoyle and Deacon Steve, like there were a whole bunch of people laying down there. And I was like, why are they letting, why are Mary and Deacon Steve letting, or pushing those people down? <laughs> and there was no one in line, and so I was like, I think I'm gonna go. So I walk over there, and they're like, what can we pray for you for? And I said, worthiness, and Deacon Steve just goes, like he physically winced. And I said, worthiness, he said, okay. They had no longer like put their hands on my head that I, I like I didn't fall I melted into the ground, so I melted into the ground and all of a sudden there was like a movie screen. I knew exactly where I was. It was my birthday. I was at St. Francis Hospital in Indianapolis, Indianapolis, and Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. It was February 16th. There was a little isolate with a baby in it. The baby was me. There was a guy looking at the baby, and he was so joyful. He was crying, and not just like tears of sweet joy. I mean, he was jumping up and down and screaming and saying, she's here, she's here, she's here. That was God. And that's not just an affirmation God gave me. That happened that day. I know that. I experienced it. I experienced it when, it, when I was a baby, and I experienced it again right there. And I started crying like, <laughs> like the like, it was ridiculous. I sounded so ridiculous. I'm so aware that I sounded ridiculous. But it was just so beautiful. I just wanted to, like, marinate in that feeling because I didn't realize it. That that's what I wanted. I wanted the relationship with the Father. And how beautiful is it that the Spirit brought me to the Father? I mean, it's, it's incredible. And so that obviously was a very transformative time for me. And just by happenstance, I knew in the back of my head I needed to go on to Unbound. Father Prentice had told me I needed to do that. And there was an Unbound going on at uh, Holy Family Parish that following week. And so I went, and I was like so excited. And it was a really great experience. I went through the Unbound ministry, but like my biggest takeaway was that Matt Lozano, who's the one that was doing the uh, talks, he was talking about the significance of names. And he said, like, it's really neat to be a parent because you partner with God and, like, whatever your parents come up with is what God will call you on heaven. It's what he calls you right now. So I thought, that's really interesting. I'd looked up my kids' names, but I hadn't looked up my own. And so all of these years, I have been calling myself unworthy, <coughs> unknown, Unworthy. Do you know what my name means? Christ follower. Anointed. See what Satan did there? He took something so long ago, before I can even ima imagine, he took my identity, which is I anointed, and he made me feel unworthy. He called me unworthy, and I owned it for 38 years. I finally saw my identity in Christ, in Christ. And so I tell you this story, and it's not a sad story. This is my love story with Jesus. It's a passionate love story, and it's, it's sad. There are a lot of sad things to it, but the story is not sad. There's lots of pain when you love somebody, and there's lots of tears. And Christ shows us that right up there on the cross. That's what love is. It's not happiness, it's not giddy, it's hard work. And that's what he did for me. It's what he did for all of you guys, too. And sometimes I think back to that day when I was in the hospital, 
wishing that I had cancer or some sort of drug addiction. And I think about, like, why is it that God spared me? And I know that there's lots of reasons. I can think of nine, my husband and my eight children, two in heaven as well. Um, those are reasons that God, was, that God had spared me. But I also know, and I knew this moment I got the text from Emily, he spared me for this night. He wanted me here to talk to you. He wanted me to affirm you in your worth. You may not have an eating disorder. You may not be in a hospital in U of M because you're doing horrible things to yourself and you just don't know why. But I'll tell you what I know about young girls. It's that they struggle with self-worth and it looks different to a lot of different people. And I just want you to know you are so worth it. And on your birthday, God did that same thing. He leapt for joy and cried tears of joy because you came. Thank you.